I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respect to the elders, both, both past and present. The traditional owners of the land upon which we meet are the Coombeberry from the Ugumba Nation. Please would you stand for the school prayer. Almighty God, from whom comes every good and perfect gift, send down your blessing and pray from the school. Teach us to live together in love and joy and peace. We now work with the spirit of our sin and perseverance. We now pray to you for the ship, and now pray to you for the joy and the spirit of our sin. Cattle Club and the Cultural Arts Prefect, Prefect sorry, and especially um, about the student exchange a bit later on. But first I'd like to hand over to Mrs. Wayne. Thank you, Meg. And welcome back to all of the girls in the senior school who have been doing their assessment over the last uh, 10 days or so. It's great to have you all back with us and to feel the school being absolutely complete again. Last time we were in assembly, I shared with you one of the women who I found quite inspiring. And today I wanted to bring the work to you of another woman who I have found inspiring in education. And that's the work of Carol Dweck. You may have heard of Carol Dweck before. She is an eminent psychologist and her work has been on mindsets and how we can either have a fixed mindset that we can believe that we have no control over what we're able to do, that our ability is fixed, or we can have a growth mindset, a mindset that allows us to understand that we actually have agency. We have the ability to learn new skills, to develop, to grow. I'd like to share with you a little bit of the work of Carol Dweck, which is presented by one of her colleagues. I'm going to warn you, I wouldn't say that he is the best presenter that I have ever come across with a TED Talk, but listen to what he has to say. Ask yourself at the moment, where do you sit in terms of your beliefs about your ability to learn? When you're reflecting at the end of this week on how you have gone with your assessment, are you saying to yourself, well, I'm pretty pleased with my process, I'm pretty pleased with what I've achieved, or are you just looking at the grade and putting it down? Consider what you can do if you continue to have a belief in yourself that you can continue to learn. Thank you. What do you think is the key to achieving our goals, our success? Some people suggest things like hard work, focus, persistence. But research shows these are all byproducts of something else, something much more powerful that we can all develop. It is this very special something that really is critical to success and is what I'm here to discuss with you today. Someone who has achieved great success is Josh Waitzkin, a chess international master and the subject of the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer. Nobody has won all the national chess championships that Josh has. But even more impressive, when he turned 21, he took on the challenge of mastering something completely new and very different from chess, martial arts. He realized that he had learned how to grow and succeed, and he could apply that understanding to other domains. And so he devoted himself relentlessly to Tai Chi Chuan. And after lots of hard work, many failures, and some broken joints, he became a great martial artist, and he won two world championships. Now he's off to jiu-jitsu. So what does Josh say is the greatest thing that ever happened to him? Believe it or not, he says, losing my first national chess championship, 
because it helped me avoid many of the psychological traps. The key trap that Josh avoided was believing that he was special, that he was smarter than other people, and that he didn't have to work hard. He could have thought of himself as a prodigy, but he doesn't think that he has extraordinary intelligence. He says, the moment we believe that success is determined by an ingrained level of ability, we will be brittle in the face of adversity. Josh often quotes Stanford professor Carol Dweck, who discovered that some people see intelligence or abilities as fixed, what is called a fixed mindset, while other people see them, as Josh does, as qualities that can be developed, a growth mindset. More important, Dr. Dweck discovered that these two different mindsets lead to very different behaviors and results. In a study she did with Dr. Lisa Blackwell, Several hundred seventh graders were surveyed to determine which mindset each student had, and then they were tracked for two years. Results showed that the students with a growth mindset, those who thought they could change their own intelligence, increased their grades over time, while those with a fixed mindset did not. You can see the trend. The gap in performance just widens and widens over time. The difference between these two groups? A different perspective on intelligence. Other studies have shown similar effects for our mindset about other abilities, like problem solving, playing sports, managing people, or anything else you'd like. Dancing la Macarena. <laughs> the key to success is not simply effort or focus or resilience, but it is the growth mindset that creates them. The mindset itself is critical. Research shows that when we directly try to build grit or persistence, it is not nearly as effective as addressing the mindset that underlies them. How many of us think of ourselves as not math people, or creative, or sociable, or athletic, or conversely, that we're naturals? If we're to fulfill our potential, we have to start thinking differently. We have to realize that our, we're not chained to our current capabilities. Neuroscience shows that the brain is very malleable, and we can change our own ability to think and to perform. In fact, many of the most accomplished people of our era were thought of by experts to have no future. People like Charles Darwin, Lucille Ball, Marcel Proust, and many others. But they, along with all great achievers, from Mozart to Einstein, built their abilities. But the key insight that I would like you to walk away with today is that when we realize that, when we realize that we can change our own abilities, when we have a growth mindset, we bring our game to new levels. So how does a growth mindset do that? It turns out that there are physiological manifestations to mindset. Brain scans show that for people with a fixed mindset, the brain becomes most active when receiving information about how the person performed, such as a grade or a score. But for people with a growth mindset, the brain becomes most active when receiving information about what they could do better next time. In other words, People with a fixed mindset worry the most about how they're judged, while those with a growth mindset focus the most on learning. There are other consequences of mindset. People with a fixed mindset see effort as a bad thing, something that only people with low capabilities need, while those with a growth mindset see effort as what makes us smart, as the way to grow. And when they hit a setback or failure, people with a fixed mindset tend to conclude that they're incapable. So to protect their ego, they lose interest or withdraw. We observe that as lack of motivation, but behind it is a fixed mindset. Whereas people with a growth mindset understand that setbacks are part of growth. So when they hit one, they find a way around it, like Josh Waitzkin did when he lost in chess or in martial arts. Research clearly shows these effects of mindset. In one study that Dr. Dweck did with Dr. Claudia Mueller, they had children do a set of puzzles. And then they praised the kids. To some of the kids, they said, well, wow, that's a really good score. You must be smart at this. That's fixed mindset praise because it portrays intelligence or abilities as a fixed quality. To other kids, they said, wow, that's a really good score. You must have tried really hard. That's growth mindset praise because it focuses on the process. Then they asked the kids, OK, what kind of puzzle would you like to do next, an easy one or a hard one? The majority of the kids who received the fixed mindset praise chose to do the easy puzzle, while the great majority of those who received the growth mindset praise chose to challenge themselves. 
Then, all the re then the researchers gave a hard puzzle to all of the kids because they were interested in seeing what confronting difficulty would do to their performance. Look at what happened when the kids later went back to the set of easier problems that they started with. The kids who received the fixed mindset praise did significantly worse than they had originally, while those who received the growth mindset praise did better. And to top it off, at the very end, kids were asked to report their scores. And the kids who received the, growth, the fixed mindset praise lied about their scores over three times more often than those who received the growth mindset praise. They did not have another way to cope with their failure. The difference between these two groups? One short little sentence. How often do we praise kids for being smart or for being great at something? We've been told that this will raise their self-esteem, but instead, it puts them in a fixed mindset. They become afraid of challenges and they lose confidence when things get hard. As Josh Waitzkin says, it is incredibly important for parents to make their feedback process related, as opposed to praising or criticizing talent. If we win because we're a winner, then when we lose, it must make us a loser. These studies show not only the mechanisms by which mindset affects performance, but they also show something else that's very important. They show that we can change mindsets. And that's important because most of us have fixed mindsets about something. Another study that showed that we can change mindsets is one in which Dweck and Blackwell did a workshop with seventh graders to instill a growth mindset in them. As a result of the workshop, the students gained more interest in learning and they worked harder. And as a result of that, their grades improved. Other studies have shown that when we teach a growth mindset, not only does it improve achievement for students as a whole, but it also narrows the achievement gap because the effects are most pronounced for the students who face negative stereotypes, such as minority students and girls in math. I've spoken mostly about children, but mindset affects all of us. In our workplaces, managers with fixed mindsets don't welcome feedback as much, and they don't mentor employees as much. And employees with growth mindsets about specific skills, like negotiations, become far better at those skills than people with fixed views. Mindsets can even help us solve big social issues. A recent study showed that when we expose Israelis and Palestinians to the idea that groups can change, they increase their attitudes toward one another, they improve them, and they enhance their willingness to compromise and to work for peace. We also see the effects of mindsets on relationships, sports, health. How is it possible that as a society, we're not asking schools to develop a growth mindset in children? Our myopic efforts to teach them facts, concepts, and even critical thinking skills is likely to fail if we don't also deliberately teach them the essential beliefs that will allow them to succeed, not only in school, but also beyond. There's a lot that we can do to change mindsets, but here are three things that any of us can do to instill a growth mindset in ourselves and in those around us. First, recognize that the growth mindset is not only beneficial, but it's also supported by science. Neuroscience shows that the brain changes and becomes more capable when we work hard to improve ourselves. Second, learn and teach others about how to develop our abilities. Learn about deliberate practice and what makes for effective effort. When we understand how to develop our abilities, we strengthen our conviction that we're in charge of them. And third, listen for your fixed mindset voice. And when you hear it, talk back with a growth mindset voice. If you hear, I can't do it, add yet. My request to you today is that you share this knowledge about the growth mindset with your family, friends, and schools so that all of us can go and fulfill our potential. Thank you. A very, very powerful message. I can't do it yet. A word that brings hope to all of us. I asked the prefects this morning if they could share with me how they felt that they had grown in their learning about themselves over the last six months. It was interesting that 
most of their reflections were not about what they were learning academically or what they were learning socially, but what they were learning about themselves as seniors in the school. And I'm going to invite a few of them to come forward and just share a little bit about their growth. So this year so far, I think one of the biggest things I've learned is um, communicating and working with other people and especially learning to recognise what others' strengths and weaknesses are. Because I know when working with some of the other girls and with teachers, you know, people respond to different things in different ways. So I've found that maybe sending one sort of email to someone will, you know, be more effective than sending a different sort of email. So I think that's been really important so far this year. Um, being head boarder, you're a big sister to 180 girls. And you're not really taught about how to be a big sister. So I guess adapting to being affectionate and to all the girls in different ways is a big thing for me this year. Um, I think realising as a human being that you're going to make errors and mistakes, and I've made plenty, um, but it's how you how it's, you constructively move on from it and how you, you know, if you decide just to give up and let things go the way they are or move on from it and really try harder and, yeah. Thank you. So I'd like you to think about that as the day continues and as the week continues and as you go into the holidays after next week. Do you have a fixed mindset or do you have a growth mindset? Perhaps you have a growth mindset in a number of different areas that you participate in and perhaps there are a few of those niggles that you need to listen to a little bit harder and remind yourself about that word yet. Have a long life ahead of you, enjoy it, make the most of it, help yourself by having a positive outlook on what you're able to achieve and what you're able to enjoy in life. Thank you. Good afternoon, girls. Just a quick update on our fundraising for Rosie's this term. So last week, as you're all aware, the girls were selling heart-shaped chocolates and ribbons at both morning tea and lunch. We managed to raise $200, and these funds will all go directly to Rosie's. So thank you very much for all of your support, and we really appreciate it. And thank you to the middle school girls that helped us sell chocolates during the week as well. However, we still have a couple more events running until the end of term. One of, this is the, one of these is the Coats for Cause Drive. We ask you to bring any old or spare coats or jumpers to the middle or senior school centres and these will be donated to Rosie's over the holidays. This campaign will be running till the end of term, so make sure you remember to have a look at home for any spare coats. Also this coming Friday, we will be having a teacher-student touch match on the Oval at lunchtime. The Open teams will take on all the coaches, so make sure you come down and watch. We will also be selling lolly bags for a dollar, um, and all the, causes, all the money raised will go to Rosie's. Um, finally, we'll be having a red free dress day on Monday um, in support of Rosie's as well. Please remember to bring a gold coin donation or a coat and try and wear some red clothes. Um, and remember to keep checking your emails for updates and reminders. And thank you again, girls, for all your support. We look forward to some great events towards the end of the term. Thank you. I'd just like to notify everyone that this Thursday we're having a milkshake day. So um, that's being held in the hospitality rooms in the Malfi buildings. And um, we'll be selling milkshakes for $3.50 at lunchtime. There'll be vanilla, chocolate and strawberry milkshakes. Um, yeah, and all, all proceeds, all, all the profit raised will go toward the coffee shop charity, which is Paradise Kids. And just to, um, I just have to commend the coffee shop girls as well because it turns out that 
even though we're halfway through the year, we've raised um, more money than what was raised last year at the end of the year, and the coffee shop girl's doing an amazing job, so well done. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. I've got a couple of things I want to talk to you about today, and hopefully I've got the iPad talking to the iMac that's out the back and it's going to talk to the iProjector. If it doesn't, Camille, Keris, get ready to hit those buttons when I yell out. I want to talk to you today about it worked, the voice, but not just any voice. I want to talk to you about student voice. You've heard Mr. Crawley talk about this a lot, and we've been discussing ways that people can be involved and share their stories and um, communicate with each other and a wider audience. Now, I'm going to apologise to a couple of people in advance. I've already talked to Isla, but I'm going to mention some of Isla Stanich's work. And those of you that don't know Isla, there she is. <laughs> and uh, oh, hang on, that's a small photo, let's zoom in. There's Isla. <laughs> and Isla has been using her voice by publishing. Now, you may not know that Isla actually had a book published on the iBook store. It was one of the ones we completed in our media arts class last year. And you can go to the bookstore, and if you just type in the word Stanich, it goes straight to her page, or you can type in Where's My Colour. And I did some stuff this morning, and without any advertising whatsoever, 135 people from around the world have downloaded Isla's book. And they come from Australia, US, Canada, UK. For some reason, she's popular in Sweden. <laughs> and Malta, one person from Malta has downloaded Isla's book. Now, for those of you that don't know, Malta is a tiny little island in the middle of the Mediterranean, <laughs> just off the southern coast of Sicily. Somebody is sitting there in the Mediterranean sun reading Where's My Colour? How exciting is that? So, what does it look like and, and who's it for? The book was written deliberately for kindergarten to grade four age two children. So if you've got young brothers or sisters or nieces or nephews, let's try and get Isla's book sales up. Well, actually, they're not sales. Let's get Isla's free downloads up. Ah, <laughs> uh, honey, it was $10 a copy, Isla. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> so I've got a short film here. Let's hope this works. And this is Skittles. And you click on Skittles, and Isla reads it to you. Chapter one, meet Skittles. Skittles was just an ordinary fish, living within the colourful environment of a coral reef. He loved his life and was very famous for the bright purples and vibrant scales he possessed. And after it's been read, you can click on the animation, and there's Skittles. Oh. And it just slides through chapter after chapter, and poor Skittles loses his colour, and he goes on this magical adventure looking for it. And he ends up in a couple of places, but the worst thing that happens chapter is... Chapter 6. Ha <laughs> ha! When the sun grows over the storm-battered coral reef, some of the other fish noticed a strange grey shape lurking in and out of the seaweed. <laughs> and look, bullying by exclusion, the fish laugh at Skittles and he has to go away, embarrassed. And so he continues on his journey and he goes to Fish Vegas. Have you seen my colour? Sorry, it's not here. <laughs> oh, what a poor sad Skittles. So you can see the way it works. And we're nearly to the end. Um, he taxes onto some sharks and he enters up in the magical city of Atlantis, where finally we can watch the whole story or we'll just read Home Time. Chapter 13. Home Time. My colour! Skittles excitedly squealed. He rushed home as fast as he could, not being able to contain his excitement for his new scales. <laughs> Well done, Isla. <laughs> the thing is, what I want to talk to you about today is anybody can do this. Forget the animation, which was the major part of what we did. Everybody's got a story in them, and I don't know if anybody remembers the very first tech conference we had here. Um, a guy called Tim Hawkes, who's the principal at King's College, gave a wonderful presentation on how we all have a novel within. And there's a book inside everybody waiting to get out. So all you need is a story. And just recently we had a creative writing competition. And I've read some of these stories and they're fabulous. 
Now there's absolutely no reason we can't quickly take those, put them into an iBook, and load them to our iBook store. St Hilda's has its own iBook store. We only have two books there at the minute, one of Isla's and one that was written by Miss Jacker and Miss Mamma. And the creative writing competition was won by Asia. Where are you, Asia? There she is. Now, I spoke to Asia about mentioning her name too, just like Isla. I didn't want to embarrass her, but if you don't want to let Asia look like this, <laughs> I'm going to zoom in on Asia. Now, Asia, I'm going to leave that photo up there until you agree to let me publish your story. Just wave out if you agree. And I can't see your hand, Asia. You'll have to be, it's got to stay there. But yes, I can. Thank you very much. I actually had spoken to her about it before, but I want to encourage everybody who was in that competition or everybody that's got a story that you're proud of to come and talk to me. And so I wanted to start to populate this bookstore. The only thing we can't do is sell them. We want to give these things away. And I've got one more quick thing to talk about. Next year, we're going to have a radio station. It's not going to go out beyond our community, unfortunately, but the nice, lovely new building that we're having, the downstairs cafeteria is going to have this wonderful speaker system all through the roof. We've got a little glass DJ radio station booth up next to the stage. And every recess and every lunchtime, I'm hoping, we're going to be producing programs. And you can sit in there and have your lunch and chill out with people and we'll just have stuff happening in the background, or you can listen to it seriously. So our radio station needs a name. Now, we're next door to Hot Tomato, and the Hot Tomato people are very kindly helping us set it all up with the right kind of equipment and gear. So, next term I'm going to run a bit of a competition to see if we can name the thing. I've already thought of Hot Cucumber. It's <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> and I like the thing. <laughs> now, we also need DJ. Now, again, I'm going to be calling out the volunteers for DJs. And we want to have more than just music. Of course we're going to have music, because that's what a radio station's about. But it's a wonderful opportunity to tell different stories. And when we've told the stories, you can have book reviews, you can have movie reviews, you can have restaurant reviews, you can have anything you like. So I want people to put their minds together and come up with a format. And we'll have a competition, you give stuff in to me, and we'll review it, and then you'll get a slot. So you'll be given like every Thursday lunchtime or every second Tuesday recess or whatever. And it'll be your job to do that. So I want you to think about two things. Publishing a novel and hosting a radio show. And now, something just as interesting, Catherine's going to talk to us about Calipon. Thank you. has been very successful this year so far. As a team, we have competed the Gundam Indy and Buna shows. Um, or we've competed this, this time with some of our girls competing at a bar show last weekend. We started this showing season off with Gundam Indy in the first week of May, when Courtney played first with her animal Baxter in the ball park. On the Saturday of the Gundy show, we had a very big day. It involved an early 4 a.m. wake up to get the cattle ready for the competition at 8 o'clock. First up, the team was entered in the Young Judges competition to judge a class of animals, and then after that finished, we showed in the paraders and the exhibitors section of the competition. After, Gun after Gunda Windy, we travelled to Boona to compete again. There were more wins at Boona with Libby winning first place, champion tropical heifer, and Grand Champion Tropical Heifer, and myself winning Grand Champion Tropical Bull. More recently, two of Laura and Anna travelled to Calbar Show to represent our school at this small show. We had a great weekend and competed very well, with Laura winning first place, Champion Tropical Heifer, and Grand Champion Tropical Female at the show. The cattle showing team has done really well so far, and we have one show to go this season. The biggest show of the year, Eka in Brisbane, in week three of next term. As many of you know, next Tuesday is Inter House Plays, and the cattle showing team will be selling baked goods after school for this event. 
We will also be selling baked goods after school on Wednesday before the Twilight concert. So as you come to support your house and your musicians over those two days next week, bring a gold coin and buy a delicious cake or two from the cattle show Thank you. Good afternoon, girls. Today, Pippin, Lorraine, and I would like to recap the cultural arts events over the final weeks of this term. Next week is Cultural Arts Week. On Monday, there's the theatre sports, and we're still looking for teams. So if you'd like to sign up, the sign-up sheet is on the board, notice board outside the Lancet Theatre. If you have any questions, please email Pippin Green. On Tuesday, there's a pump-up for the house plays. Um, there'll be lollies, so everyone, please come down to the field and room at lunch. On Wednesday, Genevieve Mauer will be organising the open mic. Those who wish to participate, please email her. Thursday is the final day of the term and the last event for the cultural arts is the teacher versus teacher debate. As an added bonus, next week there will be a guess how many jelly beans are in the jar competition. The winner with the closest guess of the number of jelly beans will of course win the jar. Only those who participate or attend any of these four days of the activities will be eligible to enter, so please come along. Tickets for the house plays are now on sale at student reception and are $5 each. The plays will be held on Tuesday the 24th at 6pm in the Langford Theatre. Please come to support these girls. Also, next week on Wednesday, there will be the final Twilight concert for this term. Please keep an eye on your emails for any more information regarding the next week. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Jenna Stark, and some of you may know that I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, which is in the United States. Atlanta is a fairly large city, and it happens to be the headquarters of Coca-Cola. I usually attend the Atlanta Girls School, Atlanta Girls School, where I'm going to be in 12th grade when it starts back up in August. Atlanta Girls School is an all-girls school, if you didn't um, already figure that out, which is like St. Hilda's. I arrived in Australia a week ago, and since then, I've been coming to school with all of you lovely people. <laughs> I've had some unique experiences so far, and I've met my amazing host family, made some friends, had a birthday, and have tasted lots of Australian cuisine, such as Tin Tans, which are delicious, and Vegemite, which is not so delicious. <laughs> Everyone has been very welcoming and I feel right at home. I'm honored to be here with all of you today. Thank you so much for being supportive. It's hard to be away from home for a couple weeks. And thank you for letting me visit your school. I'm sure I will remember this trip forever. Thank you. Scarlett, Tilly and I set off on exchange to Milford School in Somerset, England. After 30 hours of travelling, we finally arrived to England, the country that we would call home for the next five weeks. We dropped Scarlett off to her exchange family and Tilly and I were put into boarding, where we've all made lifelong friends. School at Milford is completely different to here. Boys in classes, half a day of school on Wednesday, Saturday school, a cafeteria, and being allowed to go into the local town to shop during the lunchtime. Whilst at school, we participated in many activities, including rowing in the freezing cold weather, athletics, clay pigeon shooting, tennis, skittles, which is kind of like bowling, water balloon fights, and of course, classes. We then got a week of holidays where we did various different things. We all went into London, which was an amazing experience, and Scarlett also went up to Yorkshire, and Holly and I went back to our parents' homes, our partners' homes, in East Sussex and Suffolk. Exchange overall was an amazing experience. We've all made so many lifelong friends and learned so much. 
All three of us highly recommend it to everyone in the lower years because it honestly is a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's safe to say my exchange was an experience that I will never forget. The people I was surrounded by at school, my friends, and especially my host family, were very welcoming and warming. My exchange was a St. Paul's School for Girls in Lukeville, Maryland. St. Paul's School for Girls, otherwise, oh wait, yeah, St. Paul's School for Girls shared a campus with St. Paul's and Norwood School. I was fortunate enough to be paired with the Fife family, my exchange partner Josie, and her younger sisters, Dee Dee, Bridget, and Jill. Words can't describe how appreciative I am for all the time and effort the family put in for me for making this day absolutely incredible. I went to places including Hershey World Chocolate in Pennsylvania, Fenwick Island, New York, Washington, multiple baseball and lacrosse games, talked on radio, and I went to Disney World in Florida. During my exchange, I gained, life, I gained lifelong friendships and connections, and I couldn't have asked for a better exchange experience. Exchange is an incredible experience and I'll never forget. I got to meet so many amazing girls that I still keep in touch with, with today. It was incredible to immerse myself in the American culture and I'll never forget it. I got to experience so many amazing things like going to Florida and New York, going to baseball games, lacrosse games, and of course I got to share it with my best friend Claudia. Thank you, we've had a great deal to share this afternoon. And I did actually share with Mr. Powell that if we had an opportunity that there would be one more short clip that I wanted to share with you on motivation. If it isn't enough to think about growth mindset, I want you to think about the things that help you to be personally motivated. Many of us think of it as rewards, we think about the carrot and stick approach, but there are other ways that we can be thinking about how do we keep having that most satisfying and successful life? Daniel King is the name of the um, presenter. You may have come across his work before. I recommend him to you. So the two people I'd really love you to uh, check out are Carol Dweck and Daniel King. Our motivations are unbelievably interesting. I mean, it, I, I find, I've been working on this for a few years, and I just find the topic still so amazingly engaging and, and interesting. So I want to tell you about that. The science is really surprising. The science is a little bit freaky, OK? It, we are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. There's a whole set of unbelievably interesting studies. I want to give you two that call into question this idea that if you reward something, you get more of the behavior you want. If you punish something, you get less of it. So let's talk, let's go from London to the mean streets of Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the northeastern part of the United States. And let's talk about a study done at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Here's what they did. They took a whole group of students, and they gave them a set of challenges, things like um, memorizing strings of digits, uh, solving word puzzles, other kinds of spatial puzzles, even physical tasks like throwing a ball through a hoop. Okay, they gave them these challenges, and they said, to incentivize their performance, they gave them three levels of rewards. Okay? So if you did pretty well, you got a small monetary reward. If you did medium well, you got a medium monetary reward. And if you did really well, if you were one of the top performers, you got a large cash prize. Okay? We've seen this movie before. This is essentially a typical motivation scheme within organizations. Right? We reward the very top performers. We ignore the low performers and the other folks kind of in the middle. Okay. You get a little bit. So what happens? They do the test. They have these incentives. Here's what they found out. One, as long as the task involved only mechanical skill, bonuses worked as they would be expected. The higher the pay, the better their performance. OK, that makes sense. But here's what happens. But once the task called for even rudimentary cognitive skill, 
a larger reward led to poorer performance. Now, this is strange, right? A larger reward led to poorer performance? How can that possibly be? Now, what's interesting about this is that these folks here who, who, who did this are all economists, at, at, two at MIT, one at the University of Chicago, one at Carnegie Mellon, okay, the top tier of the economics profession. And they're reaching this conclusion that seems contrary to what a lot of us learned in economics, which is, which is that the higher the reward, the better their performance. And they're saying that once you get above rudimentary cognitive skill, it's the other way around, which seems like this kind of, the idea that these rewards don't work that way seems vaguely left-wing and socialist, doesn't it? It's kind of this kind of weird socialist conspiracy. For those of you who have those conspiracy theories, I want to point out the, so, the notoriously left-wing socialist group that financed the research, the Federal Reserve Bank. So this is the mainstream of the mainstream coming to a conclusion that's quite surprising, seems to defy the laws of behavioral physics. So this is strange, a strange finding. So what do they do? They say, Let's, this, is, this is freaky. Let's go test it somewhere else. Maybe that $50 or $60 prize isn't sufficiently motivating for an MIT student, right? So let's go to a place where $50 is actually more significant relatively. Right? So let's take the experiment. We're going to go to Madurai, India, rural India, where $50, $60, whatever the number was, is actually a significant sum of money. So they replicated the experiment in India roughly as follows. Small rewards, the equivalent of two weeks salary. Um, I mean, sorry, uh, small performance, low performance, two weeks salary, medium performance, about a month's salary. Um, high performance, about two months' salary. Okay, so those are real good incentives. Okay, so you're going to get a different result here. Well, what happened, though, was that the people offered the medium reward did no better than the people offered the small reward. But this time around, the people offered the top reward. They did worst of all. Higher incentives led to worse performance. What's interesting about this is that it actually isn't all that anomalous. This has been replicated over and over and over again by psychologists, by um, some extent by sociologists, uh, and by economists, over and over and over again. For simple, straightforward tasks, those kinds of incentives, if you do this, then you get that, they're great. For tasks that are algorithmic, set of rules where you have to just follow along and get a right answer, if then rewards, carrots and sticks, outstanding. But when the task gets more complicated, when it requires some conceptual creative thinking, those kinds of motivators demonstrably don't work. In fact, money is a motivator um, at work, but in a slightly strange way. If you don't pay people enough, they won't be motivated. What's curious about there's another paradox here, which is that the best use of money as a motivator is to pay people enough to take the issue of money off the table. Pay people enough so that they're not thinking about money and they're thinking about the work. Now, once you do that, it turns out there are three factors that the science shows lead to better performance, um, not to mention personal satisfaction. <laughs> Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is our desire to be self-directed, to direct our own lives. Now, in many ways, traditional notions of management run afoul of that. Management is great if you want compliance, but if you want engagement, which is what we want in the workforce today as people are doing more complicated, sophisticated things, self-direction is better. Let me give you some examples of this, of almost radical forms of self-direction in the workplace that lead to good results. Let's start with this company right here, Atlassian an Australian company, it's a software company, and they do something really cool. Once a quarter, on a, f a Thursday afternoon, they say to their developers, for the next 24 hours, you can work on anything you want. You can work on it the way you want, you can work on it with whomever you want. All we ask is that you show the results to the company at the end of those 24 hours, in this fun kind of meeting, not a star chamber session, but this fun meeting with beer and cake and fun and other things like that. It turns out that that one day, of pure, undiluted autonomy has led to a whole array of fixes for existing software, a whole array of ideas for new products that otherwise had never emerged. One day. Now, this is not an if-then incentive. This is not the sort of thing that I would have done three years ago before I knew this research. I would have said, you want people to be creative and innovative? Give them a freaking innovation bonus. If you can do something cool, I'll give you $2,500. They're not doing this at all. They're essentially saying, you probably want to do something interesting. Let me just get out of your way. One day of autonomy produces things that had never emerged. Right, let's talk about mastery. Mastery is our urge to get better at stuff. We like to get better at stuff. This is why people play musical instruments on the weekend. You've got all these people who are acting in ways that seem irrational economically. They play musical instruments on weekends? Why? It's not going to get them a mate. It's not going to make them any money. Why are they doing it? Because it's fun. Because you get better at it, and that's satisfying.
Go back in time a little bit. Imagine, I imagine this if I went to my first economics professor, a woman named Mary Alice Shulman, and I went to her in 1983 and said, Professor Shulman, can I talk to you after class for a moment? Yeah. Just, I got this inkling. I got this idea for a business model. I just want to run it past you. Here's how it would work. You get a bunch of people around the world who are doing highly skilled work, but they're willing to do it for free and volunteer their time, 20, sometimes 30 hours a week. Okay, she's looking at you somewhat skeptically there. Oh, but I'm, but I'm not done. And then what they create, they give it away rather than sell it. This is going to be huge. <laughs> I mean, she, would have, she truly would have thought I was insane. Okay, it seemed to fly in the face of so many things. But what do you have? You have Linux powering one out of four corporate servers in Fortune 500 companies, Apache powering uh, more than the majority of web servers, uh, Wikipedia. What's going on? Why are, why are people doing this? Why are, they, why are these people, many of whom are technically sophisticated, highly skilled people who have jobs, okay? They have jobs. They're working at jobs for pay, doing challenging, doing sophisticated techno technological work. And yet, during their limited discretionary time, they do equally, if not more, technically sophisticated work, not for their employer, but for someone else for free. That's a strange economic behavior. Economists who look into it, why are they doing this? It's overwhelmingly clear. Challenge and mastery, along with making a contribution. That's it. What you see more and more is a rise of what you might call the purpose motive, is that more and more organizations want to have some kind of transcendent purpose, partly because it makes coming to work better, partly because that's the way to get better talent. Um, and what we're seeing now is, in some ways, when the profit motive becomes unmoored from the purpose motive, uh, bad things happen. Bad things ethically sometimes, but also bad things just like not good stuff, like crappy products, like lame services, like uninspiring places to work. That when the profit motive is, is, is paramount, or when it becomes completely unhitched from the purpose motive, it just, people don't do great things. More and more organizations are, are realizing this and, and sort of disturbing the categories between what's profit and what's, and what's purpose. And, and I think that that actually heralds something interesting. And I think that the companies that, organizations that are flourishing, whether they're profit, for profit, or somewhere in between, are, are, are animated by this purpose mode. Let me give you a couple of examples. Here's the founder of Skype. He says, our goal is to be disruptive, but in the cause of making the world a better place. Pretty good purpose. Here's Steve Jobs. I want to put a ding in the universe, all right? That's the kind of thing that might get you up in the morning and ra racing to go to work. So I think that, um, that we are purpose maximizers, not only profit maximizers. I think the science shows that we care about mastery very, very deeply, uh, and the science shows that we want to be self-directed. And I think that the, the big takeaway here is that if we start treating people like people and not assuming that they're simply horses, you know, slower, smaller, better-smelling horses, uh, if we get past this kind of ideology of carrots and sticks and look at the science, um, I think we can actually build organizations and work lives that make us better off, but I also think they have the promise to make our world just a little bit better. Please stand and go soft.